There is no other way to get into the kingdom. You can't metaphysically put yourself in the kingdom. You can't speak yourself into the kingdom of heaven. You can't declare, I'm a Masaka, I'm going to heaven. You got to accept Jesus and deny. Uh, Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, I know it's uh, one of those verses or chapters and books that's hard to find, so I'll give you a moment uh, to, to, to find that, uh, but while you're searching for Titus chapter 3, um, well, I'll go ahead and read from the King James Version, uh, verses 3 through 7, it says, for we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lust and pleasures, living with malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Due to many, many different flaws, uh, I'll, I'll say this, Shondalina, your flaws are not like mine and mine are not like yours, but we all at some point, some way, shape or form have our flaws. Uh, due to the flaws of mankind, I'm a firm believer that we all need a makeover. I'm a firm believer that we all sometimes just need a do-over, re hit the reset, bu reset button. The sad part about that is we have a, 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 a video game mentality where we can hit the reset button, but we still need to live in a reality that we have to realize that the only reset button that has been given to us, the believer, is through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That there's nothing on this earth that can save you. There is nothing uh, uh, that, you, that you already possess outside of the word of God that can deliver you. And so it, is, it becomes vitally important that you understand that you don't just come to church to say I have a suit or I go to this particular church, but you come to church because your life's existence depends on it. Bruh said something earlier that, that, that we, we fail to understand. My wife also alluded to it, the fact that the word has to become precious to you, not just to the preacher and his family, but not just for, 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 for hierarchy in, in the local body, but the word has to become so precious that you defend it with your life. And I believe, I believe we're in a day and age where we're going to be challenged and we are being challenged because we stand on the word. The regeneration of our human spirits by the Holy Spirit is very powerful and supernatural work that is done by the Lord so that he can get us back into relationship with him. Now, this is the tenet of faith about regeneration. This is a tenet of faith that we believe in the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And it's kind of out of order because we're dealing with baptism coming up towards the end of the month in a couple of weeks. And I realize that it's really not out of order because a lot of people come to church. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We learn the traditions of the church. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You already know it. Right? So we, we go through the motions of church, and because we sit in church, we call ourselves saved. Because we go to a local body, and we, we become a part of the local body, and, and once a year, we volunteer with that local body. We declare ourselves, because we call those things that be not, that's not scriptural, as though they were. Uh, then we declare to ourselves that we are saved. But the reality of it is, until the Holy Spirit has full control of your life, you ain't saved. You just go to church. And so it is my job today 
to sit here with you, to, to, to not condemn you because the Bible does say there is therefore now no condemnation to them who walk not after the flesh. How many church folk we got still walking after the flesh? I, I'm going to have to leave these notes for a few minutes just to talk to you because I need us to understand how important this really is. You don't understand if you walk after the flesh, check yourself in traffic. Okay? There, you just told on yourself. I don't have to point you out. Check yourself when somebody cut you off and, and, and they, or, or somebody interrupts you in your whatever important thing is. Check your attitude. What's on the inside comes out. It's not what the Bible says. It's not what goes into the man that defiles the man. It's what comes out. And here's the thing that Doug is having to look at. Not Pastor Doug, not Reverend Dr. Bishop, none of that stuff. But Doug is having to look at. When I open my mouth, what is coming out? That determines whether or not Doug has allowed the Holy Spirit to live and rule in his life. If it goes for me, the same thing holds true for you. Let's get back to this. Unless you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of your human spirit, you will have no lifeline, no inner connection back to God the Father who dwells in heaven. You will be spiritually dead with him until the Holy Spirit comes alive again in your human spirit. How many people go to church all the time, but you live a defeated life? Now, I'm not talking about your bank account, your money, your riches, your wealth, your house, your neighborhood. I'm not talking about that. Those are circumstances that all are based on where you are at a particular time in your life. And no matter where you are at that particular time in your life, it's your relationship to God that makes the brokest person rich. Because it's not about the stuff we hold. Never has been. Due to the extreme importance of this supernatural work that is done by the Holy Spirit at exactly the moment the believer's conversion to the Lord is, this revelation from the Lord must also be included as one of the tenets of our faith. John 3, and, uh, verses 3 and 5 says, I say unto you, unless one is born again, not attends church, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven, of God. And verse 5 says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You don't want to miss the, the teaching on baptism because I promise you, you ain't ready for it. I'm, I'm excited. I thought I was going to preach it today, but I had to switch it up because it wasn't time. But we have to be prepared to do more than dress the part. We're entering to a day, and I feel a, a pressure these last few months to, to warn us to be a voice uh, in, uh, crying out in the wilderness like John the baptizer to say to us, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Scary version of that is, Rod. Too many folks sitting in church thinking they saved, thinking they going to heaven. We all going. We ain't all staying. Notice that being born again is referring to being, to re referring directly to being born of the Holy Spirit himself. In other words, if you do not have the Holy Spirit living in and of your human spirit, then you are not truly born again. I know that crushes you. I know that hurts. It's like a steamroller running over your bones. But it should. It should cause you to desire to just go there more than just go through the motions. You sitting in that little seat right there, that's not it. We, we've sat in these seats for too many years. We, we, how much of the gospel do we actually do? 
how much spreading of the good news? Or, or, or do we take the good news and say, hey, it's good news, and I'm going to worry about me and my three, and that's it? Because that's the mentality that the world has given us. But this good news says to us that as wretched as Doug is, I don't have to die and go to hell because I believe in God. Because I believe in the work of the cross and because his spirit dwells and is alive in me. It is only when the Holy Spirit comes and enters your human spirit that you are truly born again. And the only way to be able to get the Holy Spirit to enter your human spirit is to be willing to accept Jesus as your, I know this is elementary, but folk ain't getting it. I know this is old, old, old school. You should have learned this in Sunday school, but folk ain't living like they understand it. There is no other way to get into the kingdom. You can't metaphysically put yourself in the kingdom. You can't speak yourself into the kingdom of heaven. You can't declare, I'm going to heaven. You've got to accept Jesus and deny the world. That's it. We either come through Jesus Christ and the blood that he personally shed for us or don't come at all. I know that's tough. I know that this is harsh, but I don't have time to play with you. For the time that is ours to share. I want to speak from the wonderful topic, Regeneration 101. Three things I want to give you and I need to get out of your way. The, the first thing that you have to do in Regeneration 101 is acknowledge drastic change. Verse 3 and verse 4 say this, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared. There's an old term, I think I've used it before, but one from one of my favorite movies, uh, forgive me for being a kid at heart, but from The Lion King, <laughs> Rafiki said, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. It's very true. The text tells us that maturity is the teacher. Being grown, age-wise, don't make you mature. I was on Marta yesterday going to a meeting down at Lenox. I saw some grown kids. That's what I saw. I saw a dude, I, I promise you, was in his 60s. Got on, hat cocked to the side, pants sagging, and I don't understand a word was coming out of his mouth. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not knocking him, but I'm saying at some point, that's got to get old. Uh, I, I have, you know, I, I talk ebonically, you know, around family and friends, and, you know, occasionally when people need to understand Decatur in church, I will say shout it. But that's just to get a point across. I don't live like that. <laughs> Maturity allows us to, to look at our lives in hindsight with a fresh perspective of the future based on the changes that we should have made in our past. This, this text tells us that for we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. When it says that, maturity teaches us that we should acknowledge that we were foolish. I was a fool. When I was a fool, I was without true spiritual understanding of who I was. I was living the way I saw Negroes living on Bruce Street because I thought that was cool. Mm -hmm. Fat and damp and all them cats was, you know, when, when I saw them, they was just so laid back with it. But I didn't know they didn't have purpose. 
I didn't know that they didn't plan to live for the next five years. But I was foolish. With my foolishness came disobedience, and disobedience is being heady and unpersuadable. Some of us think we know it all. And what's the thing that I say to my kids, that I say to y'all sometimes? Life will teach you what you're too stupid to learn. I know I shouldn't say stupid, but <laughs> it's in the dictionary. We were deceived. We were wandering, namely, out of the ways of truth. We fell to temptation. We were e easily entangled and in snares. We had malice. We desired to do harm to others and rejoice in it. It's one thing to do harm in self-defense, but to relish what happened to somebody else. That's malice. Christians are maliceful. <laughs> I told you I was going to make up a word today. Uh, we were envious. Envious is meaning, don't lead a church. We were discontent with another person's good. Some good happened to Shondalina, and because it didn't happen to us, girl, that's good. I'm so happy for you. I can't stand her. <laughs> and that's how we act. We have hatred. We were hateful not only to, to other people, but understand this. When we don't love one another, you have to ask, do you really love God? I'm going to leave that one alone. We'll come back to that one in a whole setting. Uh, not only does maturity allow us to see our flaws and shortcomings, mat maturity also teaches us to recognize when we cease from operating in our own and that we, when we begin to submit to the will and authority of God, if we can be honest in the room so I can take the pressure off of everybody being mad at me for talking about them in public, um, I, we, we can sit in the room and you can also acknowledge that God has changed some things in your life. You, you ain't as foolish yeah. as we used to be. I had to throw me back in there. You ain't as, as, as deceiving yeah. as you, 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 you still got some deception, but you still, it's just less. Yeah. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared. When we acknowledge drastic change, we are on the path to accomplish God's will for our lives, Philippians 3, 12 and 14, through 14. I'm not saying that I have this all together. I'm not standing in front of you, and please don't let this suit fool you to think that I've made it or I've arrived. I just don't have nothing to wear like I want. But I'm well on my way reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert of any or all of this. But I've got my eye on the goal. And God is beckoning us. He's calling us to come forward to Jesus. I'm off and I'm running. There's no turning back. In Re Regeneration 101, the first thing you have to do is acknowledge that there has been some drastic or needs to be some drastic changes. Secondly, not only do you acknowledge drastic change, but you acknowledge the process. Verse 5 and 6 says this, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Please read my lips and please understand this. I try to say this as often as possible because I need you to understand that it's nothing that you and I could do here on earth to work our way into heaven. It is only because of the regeneration, regenerative washing of the blood of Christ that we accept and become believers. And, and the Bible says, and a renewing of the Holy Ghost, a renewing of the Holy Ghost, meaning this, the Holy Ghost was originally in us. 
and he formed of the dust of the ground and breathed in into Adam. The, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and man came alive. I wish above all things, uh, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health. And the church takes prosper so out of context because we only see money, wealth, and things. But prosperity simply means to live vigorously. Live like it's your last breath. Live like tomorrow is your last day and you got to accomplish everything that's in front of you. That's what prosperity truly is. I recall uh, in, 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 in my younger, uh, immature stage of, of my believing, I recall uh, counting the days since my last sin. I don't act like it was just me. Uh, but I said, well, it's been three and a half weeks since I, yeah. and whatever that sin was, you know, I didn't, I didn't really keep track of all of the little bitty sins because they were just little bitty sins. But the big one, I kept a time card on the length of time. And I think the longest time that I got was about three and a half years. And I felt so prideful, small sin, about what I didn't do on a big scale that I didn't realize that all of the little stuff Add it up. Okay, so somebody with me. That's all I was looking for. Uh, I recall being an individual who focused hard on performing at an accelerated rate to prove to others that I was saved. I want to say it like this so it's understood. Uh, I, I was in church, and the church tradition taught me that, that you do X, Y, and Z, and doing X, Y, and Z on a scheduled day declares to other folk that you know the Lord, that the Lord has his hand on you, because you, you, you can't say hand because that's country. you got to say hand because that's spiritual. And so God has his hand on you. And, and in, with God having his hand on you, the, 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 the drawback is they don't see you six more days out of the week. The drawback is we thank the folk of God having his hand, his, excuse me, hand on us. One day, Sunday, because that's what we've become accustomed to. But I've come to understand that it's seven days a week, 365, and on a leap year, 366, 24 hours a day, God wants his hand on you. He wants to turn your life around. Look, let, me, let, me, let me give you a... Uh, 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 a taste of what prosperity gospel fails at. What God has for you, you have not been prepared to receive. You've been deceived to receive, but you have not been properly prepared to receive. There is something, and I don't want to sound generic, but there is a life transformation that God has for every person in this room that does not have to qualify you to stand in front of folk to preach, but your life becomes the message that transforms Transform other lives. I hope I'm saying something that we all understand. I recall being an individual who discovered the truth about my own righteousness one day. And when I when I sit and think about it, those, you know, I, I'm not I'm not a pushover. Uh, never been a punk. Uh, I ain't never bagged down from a fight, even if I lost a fight. I ain't going to admit I lost it. That's how much of a fighter I am. Um, he might have got a good lick in, but I ain't lose. Uh, but there's something that happens to the non-punk, the non-conformist, the fighter, when I think about God washing away my sins. I become overwhelmed that my manliness means absolutely nothing 
uh, the tears that come to my mind are not because I'm trying to impress you to, to think that God and I have this special relationship that I hover. I'm, I'm not trying to fool you into that, but I'm merely trying to get you to understand that at some point it made sense to me that I now understand that all of the stuff that I traditionally went through was, was to get me to a place that I have to live without the tradition, but I can't live without the God that I learned to serve. And so my, my, my passion becomes showing you and anyone who will listen the truth about my Lord and my Savior, that he is your God, but it's up to you to believe in him. It's up to you to say, God, there is wickedness in me, and I no longer want to do these wicked things, so purge me from the inside out. Transform me so that I'm not in control of the transformation. Put your hand on me and make me who you want me to be. And when I think about the truth of who I am truly as an individual, I realized I'm a sinner who has been saved. That, that, that means the world to me because, you know, being a sinner, there's a penalty for being a sinner. And, and I don't know when it became cool in the church to bring sin in the church to relate to sinners, but it only makes sinners more of a sinner. And it makes those who are fake believing more sin-like. If, if I put compromise in front of you, you live compromise. You hold on. Am I right? 75% of the things that you, you hear, you hold on to? Is that, is that the statistic? I may be wrong on that, but I'm close. We, we hold on to the majority of the things that's in front of us. And here's the scary version. Churches right now are being taught by compromising preachers. Preachers who are so full of themselves that they can't hear from God. So full of themselves and being dragged from city to city and pulpit to pulpit that they don't take the time because they don't have the time to study the richness of the word of God. So they rehash old word and call it new revelation because traveling and, and preaching, if you succumb to the method, you become a hireling. I've been there. I've been to the place that I'd never turn down engagements and it wasn't because I wanted somebody's life to be transformed. It was because my bank account was low and I needed the money. And, and I heard the scripture say, but my God shall supply all my needs. But I didn't really believe it like I should have until you get to a point that your relationship with him is everything and everything outside of that is nothing. I, I, I can truly stand before you and say, hey, it can be short. It can be without. But my God supplies all my needs. And, and when it's this short, he gives me this much more. He meets the need on time. I don't know where it's coming from, but he always meets the need. But I'm not preaching the God of the need. I'm preaching the fact that he supplies even when you don't have. And I'm not talking about your money. I'm talking about your next breath. You don't own that. It doesn't belong to you. It can be taken from you at any moment. But he supplies that. But we take it for granted. I know I have. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And Ephesians 2 and 8 and 9 says this. For by grace are you saved through faith and not that of yourselves. It is a gift of God. 
not of works, lest any man should boast in the works that's being done. This pastoral letter from Paul to Titus was in, to encourage his brother in the faith, whom he had left in Crete to lead the church, which Paul had established on one of his missionary journeys. And he left him things that would help him. A lot of, a lot of people don't understand the, the, the setup of the Bible. People don't understand the letters that Paul wrote. Paul was the apostle who started a lot of different churches in different areas, and he left instructions to the evangelists who were there. The evangelists were the ones who went in to establish the church, to, to make sure that the church had everything that it needed. And somewhere along the line, evangelism became popular. Prophecy was no longer restricted to instruction and correction. Now we prophesy for profit. And now we deceive people with thus saith the Lord. And we don't even know who he is. We don't even know that God is a great and a terrible God because we're always looking for him to give us something. We don't live like we, well, our, our lives should be transforming. Every time we come in his presence, we should be humbled because he's God. But we come to God with pride in our heart saying, Father, give me. For God, I have served your people and I have done all these wonderful, miraculous things. They even wrote about me in the AJC. <laughs> I was at a press conference with 12 other preachers and I was the one that stood out with the shiny suit. Who cares? Do you have a relationship with God? Paul said to Titus, he said in verse uh, Titus 1 uh, and 5, he said, the reason I left you in Crete was, was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Verse 16 says this, they claim to know God. But their actions deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Who is he talking about? Us. The church. Folk who go through the motions because it's Sunday. I arrive in the parking lot at 648 every Sunday because I want to do the work of the Lord. But am I getting here because I want to see lives changed? Or am I getting here because I want to stand in front of you? I could care less about standing in front of you. I'm going to be real, real honest with you. In these next couple of months and weeks and years, y'all going to see less of me. Because it ain't about me. It never has been. Y'all going to see the work and the word of God being put into action, scary version, by some of y'all. Um, <laughs> ooh, it's quiet now. It's, you know, some people are going to try to withdraw their name from the roll. <laughs> Titus 2 and 15, these then are the things you should teach and encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anybody despise you because he was younger. Than them. Not only do you acknowledge drastic changes, don't try to leave yet. It's, it's going to work out for you. You acknowledge the process, and lastly, you have a justified transformation. Verse 7 says this that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's take a quick moment to understand justification, also being justi also justification by faith. It is the act of God whereby humankind is made or accounted as just or free from guilt or the penalty of sin. You and I, because we believe Jesus died for us, it justifies us. That where you should pay for all of yesterday's sins because from the moment you believed, your sins were wiped clean. That began the regeneration process. 
That means that your sins begin to diminish. Or did they? Or did you just not sin on Sunday? Or on Friday when you had a call? Did you just not sin when you saw church folk? Because what I'm discovering, what I'm discovering is we sin less when we're accountable. Sin, sin, sin is with all of us. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, my hand is pointed out, but I'm included in that. Sin is with and in all of us. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to come within us. In regeneration or spiritual renewing, the believer, not just folk who say they love God, those who believe in the work of the cross, that it is the source of your salvation. He brings into fruition the words of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be, some of y'all don't know the Scripture. What's going on? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Old things are passed away and all things become new in a moral and a spiritual, not a physical and a natural sense. Understand this. This is the same man. He has a new disposition. He has developed or has to develop new habits. That means in order to develop new habits, you've got to cut off the old. Mm -hmm. The problem with us is we get saved. <coughs> I got a coffer. Uh, I need some water. Uh, we get saved, and it's in confession only. There is no cutting off of what we used to do. Or we go through that old method that I talked about. It's been 14 days since my last. Like, we got to go in confession with the Catholics. Forgive me, Father. It's been 14 days since my last sin. And <laughs> No. It's, it's saying to us, I no longer want to do this. Here's the conflict. I want to do it. Paul said, there's a war going on. When I want to do good, I want to do bad. Y'all act like y'all ain't never warred with yourself. There, there's a conflict going on. But the, the, winning, uh, the winning hand belongs to those who allow the Holy Spirit. Can, can, I, can I help us? Uh, and I think I've said this before, but I'll say it again uh, like I've never said it before. The truth of the matter is every time you try to fix you, you fail because you are the common denominator in all of your problems. Isn't it ironic that when, uh, another, another example, when you talk to your kids and you tell your kids right from wrong, they hear you, but it go in one ear and out the other, but then they hear somebody outside say the same thing and it clicks. Sometimes, sometimes we've turned a deaf ear to righteousness that was always right in front of us to go outside, be uncovered, to be unrighteous for sin or whatever to knock us in the mouth and say, hey, I think I need to be righteous. <laughs> you know what? I had righteousness all my childhood. You know, my mom and daddy was trying to tell me and live in a way. I know they went right. But they did some, some good stuff, and I, I should have adhered to that. And some of us, it takes 10, 15, 20, 30 years to come back. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. This is the same man. He has new disp a new disposition and new habits. The evil ones are done away with. The frequency of the sin decreases. And all of them in due time will be perfected when our mortal bodies puts on immortality. When we die 
to our sins without regeneration, which is what I understand now, the first resurrection, being born again. Allowing the blood of Jesus to cover and wash away our sins at the same time being renewed with the Holy Spirit. There is, without the, the first resurrection, without dying to your sins here on earth, there is no second resurrection. There's a second resurrection that I believe I'm going in because I'm doing everything I know how with the help of the Holy Spirit who has diminished my desires to fulfill foolishness, deceit, lust, envy, malice, all the things that I once was. My desire is not to preach you into prosperity, but to preach the hell out of you so you can go to hell. The resurrection of the just means this, that we must die to self. That's the hardest thing that you will ever have to do. Because if I can be real honest with you, and I'll just talk about me, because I think I made you feel bad enough today, but I'm selfish. I want what I want when I want it. I don't know how to say thank you sometimes. My wife went out of her way yesterday. She, I hate shopping. Shopping makes my allergies kick in. It's attitude. Uh, I have a nasty attitude when it comes to shopping. I don't like to shop. Uh, I'm the type of person I want to walk in, see something, see if it fit, walk out the door. I don't want to walk up this aisle, that one. The aisles are too small. I'm claustrophobic. I know it's off subject, but I can't stand that. Right? But my wife, because she's so loving, she decided, baby, I love to shop. I'm going to go get you some stuff. She went and picked up a pair of pants. She called me. She said, I, I need to I'm, I'll see some stuff that might fit you. And, and, and I'm just trying to show you how selfish I can be. I'm going to be real honest. It didn't hit me till later, so I'm going to apologize a little later on. Uh, but it, uh, it's, she, she like, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Whatever. Um, so uh, she went shopping. She went to the store and, and she picked up the phone and she called. She said, babe, I, I see these pants and, and, I, and here I am. Here's my selfishness off the bat. I'm hindsight 2020. I said, I, I don't. I said, what did it look like? I don't, I don't, you know, we don't have the same taste. We don't have the same style. So I don't really need any, any pants. I, to me, personally, I don't. I mean, if I could preach in my Georgia Bulldogs uh, basketball shorts, I'd be fine. I mean, y'all wouldn't have no problem with it, which one person said, yeah, that's all I needed. That's all I needed. But she went out of her way and she, she, she said, well, baby, I'm going I'm to send you a picture so you'll see. When I saw the picture, I automatically, I'm going to go ahead and tell myself, I told myself that no matter if I liked the pants or I hated the pants, I'm going to answer in a positive manner because I don't care. But I said, cool. And then she said, well, I found some slacks. I said, send me a picture. And she ain't respond, so I called her. And she was at the register. That means I ain't getting no picture. <laughs> right? I'm going way out of the way to say this because this is how selfish we can be. And this is how we need to know we've got to die to self. I got home. Pants was laid out. Two pair of pants, nice shirt. And I'm sitting there, looked at it. I saw the shirt. I like the shirt. This is my favorite color. It's purple. I like it. It's cool. So I like the pants. Pants look good. I ain't never try them on because I'm selfish. I don't care. If I can be honest, I don't care. I, it, it, clothes don't matter to me. I could, I'm really don't. So she came home. I'm still telling myself, you going to be nice because I'm selfish. Can I help y'all? You going to be nice. Come try these pants on. Yes, ma'am. I try to pass on. They fat Alba jeans. They don't really fit me, but I like them. I'm not, I, I do like them. But when she walked in the door, I didn't say thank you for going out of your way to get this. First thing I said was, I don't like them slacks. I don't like the material. It's, it's just, come on, come on, somebody. Somebody better say amen or somebody gonna get elbowed in the throat. I'm trying to help you. I don't, I don't like them slacks. I don't like the material. I like, I like super 100s or super 120s because they flow when you walk. That's, it's, you know, if, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right, but I don't like the shop. 
You know, you come in with some 13s. I don't want no 13s. That don't, don't flow is like cardboard. I'm just saying. I know what I like, but I was selfish so much so that I was so consumed with telling her what I didn't like that I never said thank you. And many of us sit in church week after week, receive the word of God. And I'm not telling you so you can walk up here and tell me thank you because y'all already know I'm selfish. I don't care. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. But we don't tell God thank you for giving us a word that's going to transform our lives. We have to die to self. We have to die to sin. We have to die. And the reason we die is so we live again. Amen. I want to die. Not no time soon. Amen. But I want to die to all of that stuff. Amen. I want to die to anything that separates me from God that I'm learning to love beyond everything. And when I learn to love him in a vertical sense, he teaches me to love horizontally so that I learn to love my wife, to appreciate the small things she does that I've taken for granted, so that I learn to love my children, to teach them to be respectful, to teach them to love and to, to care about more than just themselves. Because church folk are some hellacious people. Amen. I'm going to say this as kindly as I can. I hated some of y'all. Not y'all, but church folk in general. I couldn't stand your superficial, super spiritual, can't talk, no earthly good, can't have an easy conversation without throwing scriptures in that you don't even know. And I got to a point, sir, I'll talk to you. I got to a point that I got sick of hating people that I was just like. So I said, Lord, what you want me to do? How you want me to handle this? Because I can't hate them because I hate me. I'm just like them. My eyes are closed to you. I don't understand my purpose because I've been in this cycle of church. So I don't have a clue. And he said, if you abide in me, and my word abide in you, then you can ask what you will. And the scary part of that is I want to ask for some stuff. I want to ask for this house for my wife. I want to ask for this motorcycle for me. But I decided I simply want to understand your word because he says this to me in his word. And I ain't talking to nobody. It's just me and you. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of this stuff. You can have that and it won't even matter. So I say to us today, let's get regenerated. Let's accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Let's come out of our selfishness, out of what we want, what we desire. It don't meet or fit us. Let's come out of that mentality and say, God created me a clean heart and renew in me the right spirit. Then I'll teach transgressors your ways. A man shall be converted unto you because of the change you made in me. And I make a public announcement about my life. My desire is his will. You come to me, you know, we'll joke, we'll clown because that's part of who I am. But we're going to get stronger in the word. We're going to get stronger in this faith. We're going to be challenged not just to come to church on time, but we're going to be challenged to be the church all the time. Regeneration 101. The Father, I thank you. Lord, I simply honor you for being in control of the word. Thank you for not allowing me to preach uh, what 
I wanted to preach, but allowing you to speak through me what it is you desire for your people to hear today. Thank you uh, for all of our members, our friends, our loved ones, our families uh, that are here. Thank you for teaching us uh, to start over, to understand the basics from the beginning so that we draw closer to you, so that we hold on to you, so that more importantly, we desire you and nothing else but you. I simply honor you. I magnify you for planting this word in our hearts. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.